Good morning, First Church. Listen, I like having to compete with that. That's good. Good morning, First Church. So I tell you what, go ahead and whoever you were talking to just then, go to the exact opposite person that's near you and turn around, look around, say good morning to them right now. All right, great deal. We are glad that you're here. We're, see, this is what happens. I just lost them. Train derailed already. It's all right. all right. We are just absolutely thrilled that you're here worshiping with us this morning. Uh, if you're here uh, visiting for the first time, welcome. Uh, we are just, uh, my name is Ben. I'm the lead pastor here. Grateful to be able to glorify the King of Kings with you this morning. If you did not receive a communion element when you came in, Please let us know. You can raise your hand. We'll make sure that you get one. Uh, we've also got some in the back in some baskets. If you need those, feel free to move about and get those at any time. Uh, right now, I'm going to ask each of you, if you can, if you will, please stand to your feet with us. I'm going to invite the birthday girl, one of the birthday girls here this morning, Colleen, up, and she is going to read scripture for us and pray. Good morning, church. Great to be here today. Uh, this morning, I want to read from, as I lost it, it's 1 Corinthians th uh, 1, 3 through 5. And it states, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. You know, my family and I have been here for a short time. But in that short time, we really have been able to see just really um, how amazing and close-knit this community of Grayson is. And being a part of FCC, we've not only been able to see, but we've also been able to experience how amazing and incredible the people here are. And I know that many of you have gone through and you're going through at this very moment some really difficult and tough times. And we, my husband and I, we just want to say that our hearts ache with you, that our prayers are constantly with you and that we love you all. Let's pray. Precious Father, we just come before you this morning and we're so thankful to be here today. We're thankful that we can come to this church, that we can find comfort in each other, that we can find comfort in worship that we could find comfort in your word and through a message. But Lord, we know that you are the ultimate comfort, that you give comfort when we are hurting, when we're suffering, and even when we may be asking why. And I just pray, Lord God, that you would be our comfort today. And I pray also that you would Help us as believers to bring comfort to those in need, to each other, and to our community. And it's in your precious name I pray. Amen.
let's continue to lift God up and praise through um, scripture reading this morning. I want to read Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way, and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come and see what the Lord has done, the desolations he has brought on the earth. He makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the shields with fire. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress.
there is no one like you. I don't understand why you love a people so much who constantly fail every single day. But God, thank you to Jesus and all praise to him for making us worthy in your eyes. Thank you for making us beautiful and perfect in your vision and for taking care of us and for um, always providing for us, Lord. Thank you for your power, for your might, for being that lion, but thank you for also being that, that perfect lamb to give us gentleness when we need it and to be that comfort when we are so desperately seeking for consoling. Lord, I just ask that you would be with each and every person that's here today in everything that we're going through. Um, we know, God, that you sympathize with us and that you, you want to take on our burdens. You want us to give them up to you because you know what's after this life and you know what's in store for us. And God, just help us not to worry and to not be afraid and just to love people fiercely like Jesus did when he was here. God, we hope that um, these songs of praise and scriptures and, and, and prayer and everything that we do here today is pleasing to you and only glorifying to you and never glorifying to any of us ever. God, we, we set aside everything right now. God, we want to hear from you. We want to be taught by you, by your Holy Spirit in this place this morning. Thank you for the gift of that. And we call on your name. And we ask you to be our Father and our Lord. So God, I just thank you. Thank you so, so much. We ask all of this in Jesus' perfect name. Amen. You may be seated. In the conclusion of both Hebrews chapter 2 and Hebrews chapter 4, the author and the writer of Hebrews makes and repeats a statement that we do not have a high priest who is unfamiliar with what we go through, with our weaknesses, with our struggles, with our temptations, with our sufferings. We have a great high priest. We have a Savior who understands what it is to go through and endure those types of things. But one thing that we cannot say is we cannot say we understand what he went through. We cannot say that we know what it's like to suffer the way that Jesus suffered while he was here on earth. And each week we take a moment, a portion of our service, to at least remember, bring back to the forefront of our thoughts the sacrifice that Jesus made. A suffering that you and I have not known. And that is his suffering, not only on the cross, but in the hours that led up to that and the suffering he endured then. This is a time that we reflect on his body that was nailed upon the cross. We reflect on the blood that was shed as he endured this time. And just before he was arrested and given over, he shared a meal, a last meal with his followers and his disciples, and he instructed them in the steps of what we're getting ready to do. Here in just a moment, we're going to take bread, it represents his body. We're going to take of the cup, which represents his blood, and we're going to put ourselves in a mind frame of remembrance, reflection, and thankfulness. But before we do that, I want to encourage you just to take a few moments in silence and reflect in your mind's eye, see him on the cross and what he's done for you. And as he instructed his followers, he took the bread and he broke it. He said, this body, 
this bread that represents my body. Now take and eat. In like manner, he took the cup. He said, this cup represents my blood it was spilled for you for the new covenant. Every time that you do this, do this in remembrance of me. Now take and drink. Father, we're thankful for your sacrifice this morning. We're thankful that you suffered so that we could come to you in our sufferings. God, may you ever be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, church family. Um, my name is Mandy Langstaff. I'm the children's leader um, across the street. Um, <clears throat> and my challenge today was the offering thought. And I'm a teacher, and I like lists, and I like titles, and I like all those things. And when I was doing this thought, I, the title I wanted to put on it was laying it all down at, at Jesus' feet. When it comes to offering time, we can sometimes look at it as an exchange of money, or at least I can. You give your 10, 15, 20%, or whatever is in your wallet at that point. Um, but when Ben asked me to do this, there was a song that I just was really heavy on my heart, and I just kept singing it, even though it wasn't, not a, not a joyful noise, but I was singing it, and I was playing it in the car, and I just kept hearing it, and it, was, it just repeats the words, lay it all down, lay it all down at the feet of Jesus. And it made me think of the story when the woman comes to Jesus in Luke chapter 7, and she pours out this really expensive perfume on Jesus' feet, and she gets down on her knees, and she just cries, and her tears are washing Jesus' feet, and her hair, mine's not long enough, but her hair, you know, was, was wiping his feet clean, and just everything she had was laying at Jesus' feet. This, to me, is such a beautiful display of laying it all down at his feet, laying all you have and all you are right there in front of him. Not just your finances, but your wants and your hurts, your everyday life, everything you have at his feet. When you lay yourself down at Jesus' feet, you are restored and you are loved and you are empowered to go and serve him in many ways and live a life devoted to him. There was a member of our church named Carla, and many of you knew her, and some of you might have been, may not have got the chance to meet her, but she exemplified a life laid down at Jesus' feet. She wouldn't need to be asked to serve or give. She was just there, and she was just ready to serve. She laid her life at the feet of Jesus, and she was so in love with him that it radiated to the lives um, around her. She gave all she had. I would like to remind you this morning of your regular tithing to the church today, but I would also like to challenge you to take everything you are and everything you have and place it in the most secure place, and that is at Jesus' feet. Let's pray. God, we thank you so much that you are a God who loves and cares and knows us. And I pray today that someone, anyone, all of us, would just put it at your feet, whatever it is, the pain, the hurt, the wants, the needs, the desires, everything at your feet. It is the safest place for us. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Mandy, thank you. Um, yeah. You know, I, uh, I, I searched the world, but it couldn't fill me. That song, I asked uh, if we could sing that song today because 
that song, that, that, that line in that song was like, that was my life for 30 years. And I searched for everything that this world had to offer, and nothing could fill me. Can any, can any of you relate to that? You know, uh, it turns out it wasn't just uh, whoever sang that song, I don't even know, but uh, it's been that th- this idea has been attributed to many old dead guys. And uh, the one I like the most, I'll share with you, it's from St. Augustine from the 1700s. He said, There is a God shaped vacuum in every man and woman that only Christ can fill. And man, I just, I, I think that's so, so perfect. And we can all relate to that. I know we can. And, you know, even after we come to Christ, we have a tendency to put things into that vacuum that will not satisfy us. And in our suffering, we, at least I, I tend to want to go back to things that I think will comfort me and give me peace and give me hope and satisfaction. And... We heard last week from Ben about that we have a high priest who can sympathize with us in our sufferings, and and I think there's no there's no coincidence. I know there's not in the writer's uh, mindset that now we see a warning in Scripture, right after we see that we have our hope in this high priest. And I just want to look at Hebrews. We're going to be in Hebrews five today, but I want to look at five eight first. I don't have a slide for this, but. If you would just turn to Hebrews 5, 5, 8, it says, Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. He learned obedience through what he suffered. And, man, we hate to suffer, don't we? We do. And, 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 you know, Christ suffered because of his obedience. And, and we, suffer when we obey Christ, too, when we follow Christ. We just do. You know, I was thinking about suffering in this, you know, in light of what, what happened on Thursday. And that we, what do we say? You know, I mean, I don't even know what to say. But we suffer because we live in this fallen world, this sin-filled fallen world. My wife and I were talking about suffering, and uh, we we, we were talking about how as we study the Scriptures, as we study God's Word, we suffer because God's Word exposes these things about ourselves that we don't like to see, right? It, it shines light into our defects of character and into our struggles, and we don't like that. At least I don't. Jesus told us in Mark 8, 34, he said that if anyone would come after me, they must deny themselves, pick up their cross and follow me. I don't know about you, but I don't like denying myself. It's not something I naturally want to do. And so in light of all of that, I, I want to talk to you guys today about this is a warning about apostasy is what the Bible says. The period of translation, a, a warning against falling away from Christ. A warning here. And we've seen this, this cyclical pattern in Hebrews of, of Christ is greater than the angels. And then there was a warning right away against falling away. Christ is greater than Moses. And then another warning. We saw how Christ is our great high priest. That he's the, the great high priest that we've been waiting for. Warning. And, and we have to understand that this, this early church, this first century church, was heavily persecuted. Okay, so they knew suffering, just like we suffer today. They're, they were no different then. They suffered greatly. They were persecuted by the Romans and by the Jews. And so they had a tendency to want to go back to what was comfortable, go back to what they knew. And so we're, we're just looking at four verses today in our main, main scripture here, and it's out of Hebrews 5.11. And I'm going to read it, and then we're going to unpack it. It says, about this we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. <laughs> for, by, uh, for, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. 
But solid food is for the mature, for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. And like I said, the author here is taking this tangent, if you will, because we're going to hear about the priesthood and Melchizedek. Don't let that, don't let that confuse you. Um, don't focus on Melchizedek, okay? It's all about Jesus. Don't get, don't, get, don't get that mixed up here. But we go on this tangent here because we need to be warned to not fall back to what we used to do, but back to what we found comfort in. This word dull here is an interesting word. It, it means pretty much what you think it means, but the, uh, the Greek somewhere in there, it's, it's, it's hard to move. And, um, you know, I think about that, and I, hard to move. Think of also uh, maybe uh, set in your ways, maybe uh, uh, going back to uh, other things, you know. Maybe you've hardened your heart. Um, maybe you've, uh, you don't listen, right? That's what dull means. It means, it means all of those things. And, and this is really a lack of discipline, in, in this church's life, it, they've, they've stopped listening. They, they've gotten lazy about the word of God. And if we're not careful, we can do the same thing. You know, uh, become, it says they become dull. And that means that they weren't always dull, right? And maybe you can relate to that today. You know, that, that you've, you've, you've known the word of God and you've studied the word of God and maybe you, you've, you've, you've kind of stopped listening and you've become dull, Man, I'll tell you, I know I have. Uh, I can relate to this. I, I mean, this, this letter could have been written to me that first five years of my walk with Christ. Like I said, I didn't come to know the Lord, and he didn't save me until I was 30 years old. And I had this problem where I would follow God, and I would study his word, and I'd, I'd go to church, and I'd be with God's people. And then I don't know what would happen, but it would just become difficult, you know, and there would be suffering, and I would want to go back to the things that that I used to feed on, that I would put into that vacuum things that I thought would satisfy me, things that I thought would, would give me joy and peace and love, but they always ended up, I just, it, it, you know, I love how he says vacuum there because that's exactly what it is. It's never satisfied with all the things of this world. And so this is a good, you know, there's a difference between hearing and listening, we need to clarify this. Some of you right now are hearing what I'm saying. You're hearing me make noise, but you're not listening to me. And we are all guilty of this, but this is a dangerous thing, and this is why this is in this warning. When we go to church every Sunday, and we hear the preacher making noise, and we go through the routine of it, but we don't listen to the warnings that we hear, we're in, we get ourselves into trouble. And we're in danger of falling away and putting our hope into the things of this world because we need to be ready to go out into this world, right? We can't just leave that here. And so this, this warning is for all of us, right? This cycle, you know, I went through that same cycle of, of what he said, you know, Christ is greater than, warning, Christ is greater than. I did that in my own life for those first five years. I was like, yes, Christ, yes, Jesus. And then I'd, do so, I'd go back to the things of this world to satisfy that vacuum, and, you know, I don't, I don't think I'm the only one. I, I, I'm pretty sure I'm not. I mean, that's the basis of really what this whole letter is written about. So he goes on in verse 12. It says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone again to teach you the basic principles of the oracles of God. All... Christians, all of us are expected to grow in Christ. If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a Christian, the, the, the word Christian literally means follower of Christ. If you're a disciple, you are expected to grow. We are expected to grow. As a matter of fact, if you follow Christ, you can't not grow. If you spend time with Christ every day, you're going to become more like him. And so if, if you can look at the last year of your life, or maybe you've been a Christian for a long time, and you look back five or ten years, and you, you don't see much change in your life, you have to question that. You have to look at that and say, am I following Christ? Have I really been following God this last year? And that's, that's hard to say. I mean, I don't, you know, this, this suffering, you know, we're talking a lot about suffering this week, and this week 
preparing to, to deliver this message is it caused me some suffering because I don't want to talk about this. I like to talk about happy things. The, the author here is, is saying, you know, you should be teachers by now. Um, and what he's saying is that you, you're not, I mean, obviously. But, but, but the thing is, is here is that it's like, if, if you're not, sorry, if we're following Christ, we will teach other people. I mean, that's just part of being a Christian, right? Is, is we are all called to be disciples. We believe in the priesthood of all believers. If you've been a Christian for uh, six months, you, you, can, you have something to share and to, to help other people to grow in Christ's likeness. And so this isn't just like, I mean, obviously, if you've been following the Lord for 10 years, of course, you should be teaching. You should be teaching others in more formal ways, but, but we are all called to, to teach other people, other Christians, to come alongside them and to disciple them. You don't need a degree from KCU to, to do that. We are all called to teach. So we need to be mindful of that. Verse 12b, right at the end of that, it says, you need milk, not solid food, for everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he's a child. You need milk. <laughs> You know, this isn't a bad thing. I mean, honestly, it's not a bad thing if you're a baby. Because babies need milk, right? So listen, if you're a new Christian, man, praise God that you're here and you're getting the basic, you know, stuff of Christ. I mean, we do that in church and stuff. But milk will sustain life for only so long, right? Before long, you need more than milk. And before long, you start starving, Right? I mean, a baby, if you don't feed them more than milk after a certain point, they start to starve. And what happens when you start to starve is that you're out in this world and everything in this world is, is the opposite of what's in this. And so what do you do? You start feeding on everything of the world and you put everything into that vacuum. Just every, whatever you can put in there and nothing is enough. So you just keep putting more of whatever in there. And, and, you know, I was thinking about our, our two-year-old, Jesse. He's still nursing, I know. <laughs> He's a maniac. He's, but listen, he, he, uh, he, he is, and you know, he, he is, but he, he needs solid food now. It's not enough milk. For a two-year-old, it's not enough to just drink milk. And, and he's gotten to a point where he needs food, but he doesn't want food because it's more comfortable to just drink milk, right? And it's easier, it gives him comfort. And I think we get like this. I think we get like that. I think we just want to stay on the milk because it's easier. Like I said, the more time you spend in here, the more of, you, of, your, of your flaws and the things that aren't aligned with the Word of God you're going to see in your life. And so it's easier just to put it down and to keep drinking milk. But we can't do that because, like I said, we're going to starve. We're going to starve if we do that. And I, like I said, I'm, t I'm just speaking from experience. I did this. I did this, and man, I starved, man. And I almost killed myself because I went back to trying to stuff things into that vacuum that wouldn't fill me. We cannot just drink milk once a week and, and then go out in there and starve, man. We, we get to a point in our walk with Christ where we need to pick up a fork and a knife and start eating on the meat of God's Word. And on the things of God, we have to. We'll starve. If we're not growing in Christ every day in some way, we are dying in this world. This world does not, like I said, it just does not line up here. This, his thought here is, is, is uh, wrapped up in verse 14. But solid food is for the mature for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Constant practice. If there was a title to this message, I don't know if there was, but it would be constant practice. <laughs> constant practice. What does that mean? Man, you know, write this down. The antidote to falling away from Christ is Christ. 
That's not just, a, I'm not trying to be clever. It just is. If you don't want to don't want to fall back into your old ways and into your old things. It's Christ. It's Christ. You know, in our suffering, like I said, in, at least for myself, when I suffer, I go back to, to wanting to fill that void, to fill that vacuum with things that I know in the past have made me feel good, maybe, or, or have done the trick, you know, if you, if you will. But nothing really satisfies. But... But, you know, I was thinking about this discernment that it's talking about. It's like a baby, how a baby puts anything in its mouth, you know, has no discernment, right? Kids, they just, whatever, like, oh, you know. But, you know, this is saying that through constant practice, we've been trained. We've trained our discernment, right? Our, 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 we, we, our heart, mind, and soul has been trained, right, so that we know when something of this world that we know is toxic is going to kill us, we just spit. We don't even taste it. We don't even put it in there, Right? This idea of training is what you would think, but it, I mean, it's like, this is like Olympic sports here, training. You're training to win a gold medal. That's what it means. Trained by constant practice. And we're either constantly practicing the things of God or we're constantly practicing the things of this world. There's no two ways about it. And so that's a question we have to ask ourselves. What are we training what are we training on? Constant practice. Um, you guys have heard of Kobe Bryant, probably. He, uh, if you don't know who he is, he, aside from Michael Jordan, he was the best basketball player that ever lived. You're wrong if you disagree with me. <laughs> <laughs> but this guy, he, he was interviewed. I mean, there's a ton of interviews. He died a couple years ago in a terrible accident, but he was interviewed, and uh, they asked him, like, why are you so good, or whatever. You know, he was really arrogant. He was like, I'm the best, you know, and he said, this is why. He said, at 3 o'clock in the morning, I get up, and I go to the gym, and I work out for two hours. And he said, when I get done, I go home, and I have breakfast. And he said, does he sit around and rest of the day? No. He goes back to the gym and exercises again for two hours, you know, just the basic stuff. I mean, the basketball, you know, I mean, basketball's not rocket science, right? You just bounce a ball and you throw it in the basket, right? I mean, it takes skill, don't get me wrong. <laughs> but he, but he, it's the constant practice and the basics, the hours, man, in, day in and day out. He said by 10 o'clock or 10, 30, 11, he goes home. By then, he's already worked out twice. Most guys are just getting out of bed. And he said... So he eats lunch. What does he do? Does he take the rest of the day off, play video games with his buddies? No. He goes back to the gym. Constant practice. And, you know, I, I, I bring that up, and, and everybody's like, yeah, I mean, if you want to be the best at basketball, you got to do it. You know, if you want to be disciplined, if you want to just like, I mean, he does, dude, everything's second nature to the guy when he's playing the game, right? And I think it's interesting how we, we have a hard time translating that kind of devotion to our walk with Jesus Christ. We go, well, that's, that's, dude, you're taking this too seriously, man. You're getting too carried away here. But when we read this, there's no other, there's no, we can't come to any other conclusion here. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. I mean, if you are not constantly feeding on things of God, this world, everything in it is, is, is to pull us away from Christ, to pull us away from God. Feasting on God's word, on the word of God, is the only thing that will ever satisfy that vacuum in you. Feasting on godly things is the only way to keep us from falling back to those old things. And listen, I'm not just talking about Bible reading you know, it's easy to say, well, you're just, dude, you're, come on, don't be so legalistic. We don't have to read the Bible all the time. Joshua 1.8, it says this. It says, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you'll be careful to do everything written in it. Then you'll be prosperous and successful. Now, how do you meditate on the word day and night? You can't just, I mean, I got a job, right? I got to go to school. I can't just read the Bible all the time. No, but it's about all of the other stuff that you're putting into that 
vacuum throughout your day. It's about kids. It's about who are you hanging out with at school? Are they talking? Are they speaking the word into you at school? Or are they speaking the world into you? Think about that. That's how we, we meditate on it day and night. It's all of these things. It's that constant practice in things of God. So what do you do if, if you find yourself and you're, you, you know you've been falling away, you know you're, you're going back to filling that vacuum up with these old things? Because we all get to that. I mean, I think we all have probably been there. Maybe you're here, there right now. What do you do? What do you do? What should I do? That's the question. Oh. You know, the first thing that we have to do is we have to, we have to obviously see it. Maybe it gets pointed out. Maybe it's getting pointed out to you right now. The first thing you do is repent. You confess that. You turn around. That's what, that's what repentance is. You just, you turn around. You, you say, I'm, you know what? I see that this thing is killing me. I'm going back to this for comfort. I'm going to turn around and go to God. I'm not going to be killed by that thing anymore. Second thing is, is that we, we need to work on our relationship with Christ. And it's all about a relationship, right? Being a Christian is all about a relationship. We, we need to work on that relationship. And that is spent with, what's the number one thing in any relationship? Communication, that's good, that's good, that's second. Time. Time. Time with that person. Spending time with God is how we build our relationship with God. Like I said, this is the, con- the basics. We don't have to make this complicated. There's no higher level of Christianity. Okay, let me just tell you that. Let me break that news to you. These people that you, that you have in your mind right now, if I say, man, the most mature Christian you can think of, boom, somebody just came into your head. Guess what? Constant practice in the basics of, of God's word, of, of serving God's people, of serving every, all people, being together as a church whenever you can, that is what builds a mature Christian, by constant practice. So check your diet, right? We're talking about milk, and we're talking about meat and solid food. I figure we'd throw that in there. What's your diet look like? Think about that. What are you consuming on a regular basis? What are you putting into your eyes? What are you doing on your smartphone when you're scrolling through TikTok or whatever you're looking at? Those hours that you're just staring at that screen. What are you feeding? You cannot expect to feast on this world and to grow as a Christ follower, to not be falling back into old things and and back away from God. We have to think about that. Our diet consists of that, man, because we're feeding, we're either feeding the, the trash of this world into that vacuum, or we're, we're going to just consume things of God. I was thinking, uh, I've been here, and what, what is the most, what's like the first part of your, your diet plan? What's the one thing you should consume, like at least half your body weight in? Water. Man. It's amazing how many times Jesus used food analogies or water analogies. What did Christ say? He said, but whoever drinks of the water that I give, never thirst. You want to satisfy that vacuum in there? You want to be sure that you don't fall away? You, you wouldn't even think of going back to old things because you're so full of the things of Christ and you're so full of that living water. There's no way we're going to go back to those old ways. And then four, practice, 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 constant practice, constant practice. You know, the Word of God is, is absolutely essential. God's Word is paramount. I can't emphasize that enough. I cannot emphasize that enough. We have, we, my wife and I went out and bought this new, it's just a cheap Bible. It's 25 bucks. And... Uh, just because I wanted this particular version in a small little, I could hold my hand. 
There are mil- billions of people around the globe that can't even get their hands on one of these. I mean, they can't. They're illegal. If you get caught with a Bible, man, you are going to jail. How many Bibles do you have in your house that just sit there on the shelf? Man, I've been guilty of that. Man, we have God's word, his promises, his comfort, his peace, joy. Man, it's all right at our fingertips, and we just need to make sure that it doesn't just sit on the shelf. You know what I mean? If I could get the worship team to come up here, we're going to wrap this up. I was thinking about this list that I have up here. And this is not just a list for like a warning, like if you're in danger of falling away or, or, or that you feel yourself backsliding. This, this right here, this little list that I threw together, that list is, that's what Christians, we should all be doing. That should be just our basic, I mean, this should be, that's the basics of following Christ, is to be in God's word every day, to be a, have a repentant lifestyle. That's not, man, we, we, you don't just repent one time and start following Jesus, man. That's any time you see anything that you're putting into that vacuum that's getting in, in the way of putting Christ in there. You know, if we're not careful, we, we will become just like these Hebrews that get warned over and over and over that Christ is greater. He is our great high priest. Listen, I know that a lot of us are suffering. Losing Carla was, was devastating. What a woman, man. She exemplified this kind of stuff. She made me feel so special. You know, I thought it was just me. But she was a wonderful, what a treasure she was. And man, I, I just, you know, if you're hurting, if you're suffering, remember what we read last week, that we have a great high priest that, that has suffered everything that you've ever suffered. He knows what you're going through. We have that at our fingertips. He is there. Man, he is the great comforter. He wants to be fulfilling that vacuum in your life. We're going to sing this last song, and we're going to have a bunch of people up here to pray with you. Man, don't, don't hesitate coming up here and, and, and just and letting, it, letting it out. It's okay. Let me pray, and I'm... We'll sing. Father God, we thank you, God, for this day. God, I thank you that you've made a way, God, that that we don't have to go back to our old ways, God, that we don't have to go to this world for comfort. We don't have to go to this world for fulfillment, God, that we can go to you, God, that you are everything that we need. God, we thank you. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.
you may be seated. I have I have one real quick announcement before I hand over to Devin, um, who's going to give a few more. Um, for those of you who know, we've started an after-school program on Wednesday afternoons called FCC Drop-In. Um, it's mainly been middle schoolers. Uh, it's, we started out a little bit slow, and then this last week we had 42 kids, more than 30 of which... Yeah, it's pretty cool. So. Uh, uh, more than 30 of which have never been here before. So, um, and we've had quite a, we had three or four started coming on Sunday nights already. So, we need more help <laughs> because there's not very many of us. We weren't expecting 42 kids. So, um, if you're around and you're free and you're passionate about middle schoolers for some bizarre reason, um, then <laughs> chat to me after service. Uh, we we really could do with a couple extra hands, whether it's uh, for tutoring or for helping with the snack shop, whatever it might be. Uh, we need some help. So, thank you. Amen. Good morning. Exciting things going on. It's just so wonderful to see the outreach in the community during these times where there's hardship, there's brokenness, and people are reaching out. You know, people are hungry for the gospel. They just, you know, sometimes you just need to be friend. And Paul said, I caught you by cunning. And sometimes bringing those youth in right there, that's just an outreach way that we can touch them for the gospel. We have regular programming tonight, so if you want to come in to see The Chosen, that's going to be at 6 p.m. right here in the main sanctuary. We also have the regular youth program, middle school program, and a young kids program tonight at 6 p.m., so bring them. There's going to be a men's breakfast next Saturday, um, so want to encourage you to come on out. It'll be in the gym. If you're planning to attend, you can't attend, we just want to, you know, we need to get together and, and, and understand each other and grow in fellowship. Just what we're talking about, that's part of our practice that, that Kelly was talking about. Great message, by the way. Thank you. So um, see Chad Wolf about that. So if you just have, you want to get, just see Chad, say, yes, I'm coming. And we invite you to participate in that. Um, for all you deacons out there, please see, uh, at right after service, Jody's going to be holding a meeting. So come on, just stay in the service. It'll be a quick meeting after service today. We have a container in the lobby for the Howell's Mill uh, pack, the pantry items. So we're just invited. This uh, time, it's all about ketchup. You know, just bring your bottles of ketchup in and fill that up in there. Um, we also have just a quick few announcements from Mandy, if she'd come on up. I got distracted by the all it's about it's all about ketchup thing you got me um okay so right after church we are going to feed the children um pizza and then we're going to take them to the bowling alley from like one to three so if your student over there wants to stay for that they're more than welcome they'll stay in the blue room well in the that building gym blue room area um they can hang out there um, we're going to get pizza for them from the Little Caesars and feed them and then take them over to the bowling alley. Now, if you want to pick them up from the bowling alley, that's fine. If you want to take them to the bowling alley, that's fine. We will be taking a church van over there, um, so you don't have to take them if you just want to leave them with us and do whatever you do until 3. Um, that's fine, too. Um, and then you can pick them up from the bowling alley as long as you tell one of us that you are taking them. That's fine. And then um, if you don't want to pick them up from the bowling alley, if you want that extra like five, ten minutes or whatever, um, we'll be back here at like 3.10-ish. Okay? So that is that on that. Revolving door. I'm next. Okay. Um, so I've got a quick question, clarification question. What is the age range on the free pizza and bowling? Asking for, well, me. <laughs> oh, okay, pre-K through fifth grade, all right. I may be a little bit older than that. All right, uh, first things first, couple things. Uh, Gracie, come on up here, please. Uh, this is Gracie B. Her last name is technically no longer starts with the B, but it will always be Gracie B. This is Gracie Dyer. Uh, she's been with us for a while now, and she has come forward this morning to officially put her membership in here at First Church. So uh, she, is, she is already a baptized believer, so I'm just going to ask you to repeat this after me, okay? I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the, Christ the, Son of the, living God. the Son of the living God. Amen. Make sure you stay, stick around afterwards and greet her. Helped coach her in middle school basketball. It's probably why she's not playing professionally right now. All right. 
So this morning, to, uh, to kind of wrap things up and to dismiss, um, you know, it's been mentioned a couple times in here, just a devastating loss to the church family uh, with, with Carla Holland this week. Someone who uh, undoubtedly we could all uh, tell stories about, talk about how she impacted her lives and just really uh, made us feel so special and loved. One of the things that she had commented to me uh, that she loved when the church did uh, was at times that we would have like special dismissal prayer type things. You know, there, whenever teams go out, you know, mission trips, things of that nature, we'll always bring them up and then we'll surround them as a congregation. Then other times, uh, we're going to do something that she really, really enjoyed doing uh, to do a dismissal prayer this morning. I'm going to ask you if you would to stand to your feet. Uh, and I know that right now with RSV, uh, flu, I mean, just Ebola, I'm not for sure what all's going around at this point, but I know that like the hands are, are like not really good to just be grabbing all over the place. But what I would like f to ask you to do is kind of move together a little bit from this row to this row, kind of move into the center there. You can just stay in a line there. If you're comfortable, if the person's comfortable that's next to you, put a hand on their shoulder, do something. And if not, just stand close by them if you would. And I'm just going to lead us in prayer uh, just for a time of comfort because it is so, so crucial for us in these moments to, uh, to truly look at these sources that can provide us with true comfort. Just like Kelly was talking about, all other sources that we'll find comfort in are fleeting, they'll never last, and they'll always lead us into a search for another source of comfort, but not Jesus Christ. So we're going to pray this morning as a church family. If you want to lift your voices, you may. If you want to pray in your head, that's fine too. But let's just go together for our dismissal prayer. Father, we come to you right now as a church family. We lift you up. We glorify you. And even in moments where we don't understand, where there will be no words that will ever be able to be placed, where we may not understand what's happened even when we get into heaven. God, we still recognize you and your goodness. God, I pray right now for comfort for Carla's family or for everyone who loved her, that was close to her. God, that she had impacted their lives. God, I just pray for a peace that passes all understanding, a strength that is truly supernatural and a comfort that can only come from your Holy Spirit dwelling inside of us. Father, I pray that we could be more like Carla in our approach to people and making each and every one feel special and loved. Father, it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. We love you, church. Have a blessed Sunday.